Good evening. I almost said good morning. I've been telling myself, say good evening when you walk out there. Don't, don't make the mistake, because I told about 40 of you good morning as uh, I was walking around before service this evening. If you've got your Bibles, we want to open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. It's where we will begin today. I'll give you a little time to get there. I'm really glad you've made it out here to be with us on this Good Friday as we celebrate and remember and recall all that Jesus did for us. You know, I've been reflecting on the scriptures surrounding the passion of Jesus for the past several months, um, starting really last fall whenever I started outlining and putting this sermon series called Collision together. And, and one of the things that, that has really struck me and one of the things that the Lord has really revealed to me along that journey in that time of preparation was that so many people love to celebrate the resurrection of Christ on Sunday, and, and we should, amen? Like, I mean, that's, that's a highlight uh, for sure. But you, you cannot really understand or appreciate or, or even truly celebrate the resurrection on Sunday until you have wrestled with and sat in the midst of and really under the weight of what happened on Thursday and Friday. And so tonight, I want us to walk through five different passages of Scripture that took place on Thursday. We're going we're gonna to really back up even before Friday. We're going to look at some stuff that happened before Good Friday and I want us just to kind of sit with the weight of it and to also see how it applies to our life. Um, I want us to think about a, a specific kind of, of collision, a collision with devotion. And we see that all over what happens on the first Good Friday. And we see that all over what happened on Thursday night before Good Friday. And, and the reality is there's still a huge collision with devotion happening in our world today, it's happening in our churches today, it's happening in our marriages today, it's, it's happening all around us. And the collision with devotion is, is, is really a collision between commitment and indifference. And on that first Good Friday, this collision between commitment and indifference, the collision with devotion or of devotion, it can be seen all over the scriptures. Tonight we'll start where we've already begun, at the Lord's table, as we wrestle with the weight of that Thursday and Friday, and with our own battle with what true devotion looks like. In Luke 22, starting in verse 14, it says, When the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Those are pretty stark words. Those are pretty serious words. Those are words that should have caught the attentions of the disciples. Amen? It says in verse 17, Then he, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not eat or drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and he gave thanks. He broke it, gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Right here in this text, we clearly see Jesus' devotion. We see his, his devotion to the Father. We see his devotion to us. We see that his devotion is unshakable. He has resolved inside of his heart and all of who he is that he's going to do what has to be done, what he knows is waiting for him and his passion. And before we go any further, let me, let me just give you the big idea for tonight. It's this, three, three very important words, indifference is dangerous. We see great devotion in Jesus, but we're about to unpack a series of moments of indifference in the lives of these disciples that he shared this meal with. And the reality is, I mean, some of y'all may be sitting here and going, well, I'm not even a Christian, I'm not even a disciple. 
So maybe indifference doesn't matter to me. Well, the truth of the matter is indifference always matters. Indifference and commitment matter in every area of your life. It's especially true for a disciple of Jesus, but it matters in every area of your life. If you don't believe me, just think about this. Indifference at your job. Have, have a spirit of indifference or an attitude of indifference at your do- job. That's going to be dangerous for your career. You're probably not going to last there 20, 30, 40 years. You're probably never going to become the boss or the supervisor if you're just indifferent to everything when you show up on Monday. Indifference in your marriage is dangerous for your family. Indifference with your health is dangerous for your future. Indifference with your driving is dangerous to yourself and others. Take that from somebody who drove on the highway today. Please don't be indifferent about that aspect of your life. Indifference with your finances is dangerous to your credit score. Indifference toward your faith is dangerous to your eternity. Indifference is dangerous, no matter how you look at it, no matter what area of life you choose to be indifferent in. Given the choice between a committed person and an indifferent person, you would pick a committed person every time, wouldn't you? When you you decide, hey, I'm going to get married, are you looking for somebody who's pretty indifferent towards you or somebody who's committed to you? Committed, right? Right? When you're going to hire an employee, are you looking for somebody who comes in with an attitude and spirit of indifference or somebody that you can tell has a resolve and a commitment to the mission and the values and the attitude of whatever it is industry you work in? We're, We're looking for committed people in every area of our life. Given the choice between somebody who is indifferent toward anything or committed to anything, we would always pick the committed person every time. I say that to make this point, the devil loves it when God's people choose indifference. He hates it when we're committed, but he loves it when we are indifferent to whatever it is. And so this collision of devotion happens in our lives all the time where we have to make a decision, are we going to be indifferent or are we going to be committed? And I'm telling you, indifference is dangerous. You know, sometimes I had this conversation with a friend this week, and um, it's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. Like, sometimes you think you kind of, you get in a pretty good place with the Lord, and so you'll pray a brave prayer. Anybody ever prayed a brave prayer to God? So a brave prayer is, is something like this. Lord, show me the areas of my life that I'm indifferent. Because you think you're pretty committed and, 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 and I prayed that prayer about two weeks ago, and, and I'll tell you how I felt like God responded to that prayer. I felt like God said, oh, okay, you want to see? Oh, you want me to show you? I'm glad you asked. I'll be glad to show you. Right? Have you ever felt like God did that to you? Oh, I'm glad you finally asked. Oh, I'll show you. Oh, oh okay, I, I got a whole list here. See, there can be indifference inside of us even when we feel like we're very committed. Even in differences, we'll see in one of these examples that we can't see ourselves, but God can see. I want, to, I want you to see four different levels or four different uh, examples of indifference that led to something extremely negative and extremely dangerous on this first Thursday and Good Friday. Point number one is this, when the committed clash. One of the problems with indifference is it also it often leads to disunity it often leads to to people fighting with each other and getting mad at one another because they become indifferent over things when you're committed you're typically drawn to be unified around something but when you become indifferent that starts to pull people apart that's why indifference is dangerous and i say when the committed clash because we just read this text of the lord's supper and And this can't be lost on us. I mean, you don't have to be a great theological uh, expert to figure this out. The people in the room with Jesus are here at this table because of their commitment to him. Some of them had left their families to follow Jesus. Some of them had, had left very lucrative careers to follow Jesus. Every single one of them had suffered 
and sacrificed in some way by this point in their journey with Jesus, they are in the room at the table with Jesus because they are some of, now let me rephrase that, they are probably the most committed disciples in the world at the time to the cause of Christ. It's why they're there. It's why Jesus is sharing this very important meal with them because they are his committed disciples, his apostles. And, and he leads them in this first Lord's Supper. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And you would think, you would think that these committed men, these committed disciples in the room at the moment would have grasped the gravity of that moment. But I want you to see what happens next. In verse 21, Jesus says, But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And then it says in verse 23, So they begin to argue among themselves which of them could be who was going to do it. A fight breaks out. All of the talk of love that Jesus had shared with these men, all of the, the talk and the lessons about serving one another, all of the sermons, all of the parables, all of the miracles, all of the chats they had had on the roads as they were walking from village to village. And here they are fighting and clashing with each other right after they've taken the first Lord's Supper together. Verse 24, then a dispute also arose among them. This gets worse, y'all. A dispute arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. Seems like a good argument to have on this night. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors, it is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you should become the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I'm among you as one who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials, these, these committed people. I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But they're clashing and fighting over who's, who's going to be the greatest. Clashing over who's going to betray Jesus. And Jesus had just a few minutes before said, I had fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus has wanted to have this time with these guys he'd wanted to do this he he'd been I don't think looking forward to it in the sense that we're looking forward to certain things in our life but he knew this day was coming and he, he was ready when it arrived and these disciples who are supposed to be supposed to be the most committed instead somehow all expose a little bit of indifference in their life at least to the moment that they're in with Jesus and it leads to fighting and clashing and arguing and disputes. Because again, true commitment will always lead us to unity together, but indifference will always lead us to be pulled apart and to start clashing. And this is true for every area of your life, but especially your faith, which is why I tell you that indifference is dangerous. We don't have to go further, much further into the text to see another dangerous aspect of indifference. If we jump down to verse 31, we see point number two before us. I call this, when the committed capitulate. This has to do with Peter. And Jesus is going to even warn Peter about what he's fixing to do. He warns Peter, he tells Peter exactly what is going to happen. And Peter, Peter professes his loyalty and his total devotion and commitment to Jesus. Look at this in verse 31. Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and that you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. 
Lord, he told him, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Peter thinks he is so committed. Peter, Peter thinks he is so ready. Peter thinks there is nothing that is going to get in the way of his devotion to Jesus. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you deny me three times. Until you deny me three times, you're going to deny that you even know me. Three times before that rooster crows. I think there are a couple of really good lessons here for us if we just look at this for what it is, right? I think the first one is this, you can't fool Jesus. I, I really feel like Peter was very sincere. He probably fully believed what he said. I think Peter really believed he was committed. I, I think Peter thought he was at that place in his life where he was ready to go to prison. He was ready to even die with Jesus. I don't think he flippantly said those words. I think he meant it on some level. I, th I think he was sincere about it, but Jesus wasn't fooled by it. Jesus could see into the life of Peter, and he knew that there was still a tinge, still a bit of indifference inside of him that was going to be expressed and exposed in his capitulation that night. He knew that Peter was going to crumble when the pressure came. He knew that Peter would capitulate three times and say he didn't even know Jesus. Church, you can't fool Jesus. There was just a little small bit of indifference inside of Peter. And I, I, don't, I don't even know if he knew it was there, but Jesus did. And when he was pressed that night, when he was pointed out as being one of the disciples... In Peter's mind, there was just a, a seed of indifference that said, it, you know what, it doesn't matter right now. No, I don't know the guy. He did it three times even though Jesus had told him he was going to do it. You see, even just a little bit of indifference in our lives is dangerous because that little bitty seed can grow, and it always grows at the worst time, doesn't it? I think the second thing we see here in, in church, we need, to, we need to pay attention to this one. The second thing we see here is this, no one is immune from becoming indifferent. Nobody, nobody gets to a place in their, their walk or their faith where this can't become an issue for their walk and their faith. Peter was the bold one. Peter was the forceful one. Peter was the one who said in Luke chapter 9 verse 20, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter's the one who answers, you're God's Messiah, you're the Christ. Peter, Peter's the loudmouth of the bunch. If you would have looked at the 12 disciples, if, if you would have just lined them up and, and said, I'm going to pick the most committed, I'm going to put you in order from most committed to least committed, I'm pretty sure Peter's going to be at the top of that list. Peter has been following him, Peter has been devoted to him, Peter has been, been vocal about who Jesus is. Peter's the one who gets out of the boat and walks on the water. I mean, you, you talk about some commitment in the middle of a storm. Peter had been under pressure before and, and risen to that moment. He had risen to that level of commitment, but there was still a little seed of indifference inside of him that I don't even know if he knew was there, but Jesus did. And that little bit of indifference told him that night as he was warming himself by the fire you know what, it doesn't matter right now if you claim to know Christ or not. Or, or maybe that little seed of indifference told him, well, don't do it right now because you don't want to get arrested too. Or maybe that little seed of indifference told him, well, you know, you can do more good out here to help him than you can if you get arrested. I don't know what that little seed said, but there was enough indifference in there for him to go, you know what, it doesn't matter right now. No, I don't know the guy. See, just a little bit of indifference is very dangerous. And the third thing we need to see, the third thing we can learn from this thing with Peter is this, and this is another important one. A mistake or a moment of indifference doesn't have the power to ruin us in God's eyes. And we can praise God for that one. Because we have all been indifferent at some point in our lives, probably to 
an even greater degree than Peter's moment of indifference here. Jesus knew that indifference was inside of Peter. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He warned Peter about it. And Peter said, no, I wouldn't, I'm going to go to prison. I'll go to death. And Jesus says, no, actually, it's going to be different than that. Tonight, before the rooster crows. And Jesus also knew that God had a plan for Peter. He knew that God had a purpose for Peter. It's why Jesus said this. Whenever he's outlining all of this for Peter, he says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that God had a plan and a purpose for Peter. He he knew that that moment of indifference wasn't going to be the end of Peter's faith. He knew that that moment of indifference wasn't going to be the end of Peter's ministry. So he says, you, when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that indifference is dangerous, but we also can't lose sight of the fact that even if we have a moment of indifference in our lives that causes major damage, God can still use us. Because all indifference eventually causes damage, doesn't it? It damages us, it damages our families, it damages our friends, it can damage our career. A moment of indifference can damage your reputation and your character. But thankfully, with God, you can never be damaged to the point where you're beyond repair. That a single moment of indifference can total your life. Now, let's be clear here. If you remain indifferent to the gospel your entire life, if you remain indifferent to the grace of God your entire life, if you die in your indifference towards the Son of God, towards the gospel, towards what He did for you on the cross, if you die inside of that indifference, that will indeed bring about eternal consequences. But a single moment of indifference for a disciple is dangerous, but it's never fatal. So if you have that moment or have had that moment and maybe are even stuck in that moment today, know that God still loves you and has a plan for you. You probably know what happened, but I don't want to leave you hanging. Let's jump down to verse 60 and then we'll come back. But in verse 60, it says this, but Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. This is the third time he said that. And then immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And so Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Indifference is dangerous. Number three, I call this one the committed cave. After they left the upper room, they went to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. The garden's still there today. It's just outside the walls of Jerusalem. It's one of my absolute favorite places to go when we are in the Holy Land. It, it, it's one of the, it, it's the place I never want to leave. If, if every time our time is up and it's time for us to leave, I don't want to leave this place. I love to pray in this place. And when I do, I'm not only reminded of the great commitment of Jesus on that night, I'm also always reminded of the reality that these committed disciples caved in and went to sleep when Jesus asked them to pray with him. They were indifferent. In the moment, they were indifferent to the plight of Christ. They were indifferent to the request of Christ to remain with him and pray. They were indifferent to the warnings and pronouncements he had made in the upper room about what was about to happen to him. They were so indifferent to this very simple request that Jesus made, and they caved in, and they went to sleep. Luke records it like this in verse 39 of 22. He went out and made his way, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he told them, pray that you may not fall into temptation and then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and began to pray father if you are willing take this cup away from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done and then an angel from heaven appeared to him strengthening him 
Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. Now, church, let me just be honest with you. I'm not judging these guys, okay? I'm not saying I would have done any better. In fact, I know I wouldn't have. I get it. It's been a long day. It's been an emotional day. They are physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. And here they are in this peaceful garden outside the city. The cool night air has settled in. They just left the upper room where they had supper. Their bellies are full. The breeze is blowing through the trees. The stillness and the silence is all they can hear. And I'm sure they started to pray. They closed their eyes and they started praying just like Jesus had asked them. The next thing they knew, they were asleep. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have ever fallen asleep when you were praying. But I'm going to tell you, I'm embarrassed to say I can't count the number of times I've done it. I'm not saying I would have done any better than these guys. In fact, in Matthew's account of this, he records that the disciples fell asleep not once, not twice, but three times. Three times Jesus came and said, hey, get up and pray like I've asked you to pray. And, but there, there was some level of indifference in them that convinced them that it was okay to just go to sleep rather than stay awake and pray. So one by one, they all caved. And Jesus knew they all would. Matthew records that Jesus told them this when he predicted that they would deny him. And I'm not saying Jesus was speaking exactly to them going to sleep, but he knew this was going to be a part of it for all of them. It says in verse 31 of Matthew 26, Then Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus knew that despite the fact that these guys all thought they were committed, not a single one of them was going to remain fully committed through the night. On that night, there was just a little bit of indifference, at least a little bit of indifference in every single one of them. So as we wrestle with these events, I suspect if we're being honest, we have to admit there's a little bit of indifference inside of all of us too. And we might want to deal with that because, as we've said, indifference is dangerous. I want to close with this last one. When the committed conspire... On some level, and I want to be clear here, on some level, but not a spiritual level, Judas was committed to Christ. Not in a spiritual way, that's clear. But the Gospel of Luke, for example, records in in Luke chapter 6 that Jesus goes and spends all night in prayer before he calls the names of his twelve apostles, one of which is Judas. Judas. Judas is is later in Luke chapter 9. He's sent out by Jesus to proclaim the gospel. We know that Judas is is the guy in charge of the money bag. He's, He's the trusted treasurer for the group. And we know from the events, even in the upper room at the Lord's table, that they don't even suspect that Judas is going to be the betrayer. In John's Gospel, John 13, verse 28 through 30, it says none of those, verse 28 of John 13, none of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to them. They're they're astonished that Jesus is is pointing Judas out as the one. They didn't know why he said this to him. Since Judas kept the money bag, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or that he should give something to the poor. And after receiving the piece of bread he immediately left and it was night 
They don't even know why Judas left. They're, They're not even suspecting him. I say all of this to make this point. Judas on the outside looked like he was just as committed as all the other guys in the room. Judas had left things behind to follow Jesus. Judas had made sacrifices and suffered in following Jesus. Judas looked committed on the outside, but he hadn't fooled Jesus. He hadn't fooled Jesus, not even from the very beginning. Jesus knew who Judas was. Jesus Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. But he looked committed on the outside to everybody else. You probably know what this looks like. I bet this has happened to you. How many of you have ever thought that somebody was committed? Should I ask you? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. They might be sitting next to you. (laughs) But how many of you have ever thought that somebody was committed to you? Or committed to your cause? Or committed to your mission? Or committed to your values? And only later you discovered that they weren't committed at all. They were very indifferent. And they betrayed you and even conspired against you. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there, and we all know what that's like. I think two things can be said about this kind of thing. Number one, we've all encountered a Judas at some point in our life, haven't we? We know exactly who this kind of guy is, or gal. And number two, if we're being honest, we've all been a Judas at some point in our life, too. And when we were, I guarantee you it sprang from a spirit of indifference. You came to some place in your life where you said, I don't care what they think. I don't care if they never talk to me anymore. I don't care if I burn that whole bridge. I don't care if I blow the whole ship up. Ship. (laughs) Want to be careful. I don't care. You got to a place in your life where you were just indifferent to the whole situation. Because every Judas in the history of the world has had a spirit of indifference inside of them. This is why Luke records this in Luke 22, 47 through 48. While he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came and one of the twelve named Judas was leading them. He came near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Satan took somebody who looked very committed on the outside and he fanned the flame of indifference on the inside of this man to the point that that flame got so hot he was willing to conspire against the Son of God. He brings about the arrest of Jesus and ultimately the death of Jesus. Even if people look committed on the outside, the reality is there can still be a spirit of indifference on the inside, and indifference is dangerous. Church, when it comes to who wins the Super Bowl, or the World Cup, or the NFR, honestly, I don't care. I'm pretty indifferent to those kinds of things. When it comes to like, Questions like, which is better, vanilla or chocolate ice cream? I got my favorite. You can have yours. I'm indifferent about it. We can still be friends. I don't care. I don't think it really matters. I don't really care, and I don't think it really matters if you like Ford or Chevy or Dodge or, hey, if Tesla is your favorite automobile manufacturer, more power to you. I'm indifferent to it. I don't think it matters. I'm a dog person. Maybe you're a cat person. That's okay. You can be wrong. (laughs) It's a free country. But I'm indifferent to those kinds of things. We can still be friends, Jess, you and I. We we can hang out. I'll bring my 150-pound dog and let him play with your little cat for a while. See if they'll be friends, too. It's okay. I'm indifferent about that kind of stuff is all I'm saying. But hear me when I say this, all joking aside, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the gospel, indifference is dangerous. And you better decide 
if you're going to be committed or if you're going to remain indifferent. Because I promise you this, the devil is going to crash into and collide with your devotion as you walk with Christ. And any little bit of indifference inside of you is dangerous and it will get exposed and it will be exploited to his advantage. He might use it to get you to clash with other people. He might use it to get you to capitulate and cave. He might even use it and fan that flame enough to make you conspire to do something you never thought you would do. Indifference is dangerous. You better deal with it if it's in there. There was clearly no indifference in Jesus. It was all commitment inside of him. Look with me. Verse 42, Luke 22, and we'll end here. Jesus prayed this, Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That, my friends, is commitment. There's no indifference inside of him. Not my will, yours be done. And he did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for us. He went to the cross. He died, was put in that grave on Friday night. And he rose on Sunday. We're going to celebrate that Sunday, and I hope you'll be here. Amen. Amen. It shouldn't be lost on us that it was probably about this time they were rolling the stone over that tomb. Putting the soldiers all the way around it, sealing it. So as we prepare to make our decision as to whether we're going to be committed or indifferent, as we prepare to worship one last time, I hope you'll consider that. Let's pray. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to the Lord, you've never made a full commitment to Him, you've never repented of your sins, giving yourself fully to Him, I would encourage you, to do that he died for you so you can live he went to the cross so you could be saved he came out of that tomb so you could have eternal life if you've never believed and confessed we want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight not by walking an aisle or raising a hand but simply by praying with us if that's you and you want to call on Jesus just say Lord it's me I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. So I ask now by faith that you would save me. I ask by faith that you would wash my sins away. That you would make me new and whole. I thank you for your grace, your goodness your love and your mercy. I thank you for being so committed to me. Father, as we close tonight, I suspect there's an area of indifference in all of our lives. Maybe it's big, maybe it's small. Maybe it's something we don't even know that's there but it is. Father, I pray we would have the courage to deal with such things because indifference is dangerous. Lord, I pray that as your disciples, we would be fully committed to the gospel, to your church, to you. Lord, that our love and our devotion and our passion would be evident to all. that you would help us deal with any level of indifference in our lives so when the time comes and the collision happens it won't be able to be exploited or exposed Lord we ask this tonight in Jesus name Amen